Welcome back, everyone. We're going to get started here uh, with a great conversation between um, Managing Director uh, Paul Fico of EY and our great and good friend, uh, Lieutenant General Neil, Neil Thurgood, who has joined us before. We're happy to have him back, and we're going to go to them uh, right now. Perfect. Great. Well, thank you, uh, David and Scott. And I, I believe we have a video to, to, to start off, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, sir. We are at a unique time in our history. After years of counterinsurgency and counterterrorist missions, the United States has once again adjusted its national defense strategy to focus on great power competition with near peer adversaries. The Army must modernize and, able, and in order to win the great power competition. To help modernize and meet this challenge, the Army needs unique organizations with unique authorities. The Army's Rapid Capabilities and Critical Technologies Office, or RCCTO, is designed to fill this role. The RCCTO is delivering rapid experimental prototypes with residual combat capability to combat units in support of the Army modernization strategy and the national defense strategy. The time for acting is now. So the RICTO receives its priorities and authorities directly from the Army's senior leadership to execute critical efforts in support of the national defense strategy and the Army's modernization strategy. We are part of a modernization continuum that includes Army Futures Command and ASALT's program executive offices. We partner with multiple organizations to deliver rapid prototypes that bridge the valley of death between science and technology to programs of record. But we are delivering much more than prototypes. We are ensuring the support is in place so our soldiers can execute their mission and the Army can sustain these valuable weapons. While our portfolio includes national strategic priorities like hypersonics and directed energy, RICTO also delivers emerging technologies and supports a joint counter small UAS mission. We are prototyping innovative capabilities like hybrid electric vehicles, weapon system cyber resiliency, and dismounted electronic warfare kits, and more. Hello, Thank you, David Scott. I, I well, welcome. First of all, I want to, uh, Paul, I want to uh, share with the audience a little bio here that I've got. Uh, EY's aerospace and defense sector leader, that who is uh, who Paul is, has over 30 years of experience, of relevant experience serving A&D, industrial and technology companies, serves as the global coordinating service partner on several large multinational accounts. And he has held a number of leadership roles that EY, including regional and America's leadership roles in our transaction advisory services, and will serve in as the global corporate development leader for TAS. Uh, Paul oversaw the uh, acquisition of the Parthenon Group, one of EY's largest acquisitions. And most recently, Paul served as EY's global and America's chief talent development officer, in which he oversaw large strategic projects related to our workforce transformation. Busy, busy, busy. Welcome, welcome. Thank you so much, Paul. Delighted to have you here. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, it's an honor to be here on behalf of EY and an honor to talk to you, General Thurgood, uh, about this important topic, about how we innovate, how we go faster to create and operationalize you know, the future technologies that will uh, continue to maintain our, our world leadership. Uh, and so, um, you know, I, to start out, uh, General Thurgood, you know, I, I, uh, I, I got a chance to see the uh, discussion you had on a previous America's Future Series uh, session back in the fall, I believe it was, uh, when you talked about uh, the, uh, the Rapid Capabilities and Critical Technologies Office, I'm going to say RCCTO to make it easier, uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, some of the, uh, you talked about the, the the organization as well as the programs that fall under its mission. So maybe uh, just to start, can you give us an update on uh, on your major programs and the status? Oh, and I think you might be on mute. Sorry. How about now? Can you hear us? There okay? you go. There you go. Thank you. Thanks. Well, first of all, it's great to to be here. Thanks for the opportunity, Paul, into the America's Futures series. Uh, thanks for allowing us the opportunity to kind of share our story uh, with what we do and, and how we execute our mission set that we've been given by our leadership of our Army. 
Uh, as you mentioned, Paul, we, we are a little bit unique in, in how we execute and how we receive our missions and in how we have authorities to move at a, a pace uh, that allows us to bring combat power to bear uh, should it be needed against our adversaries. So as Paul mentioned, we, we have uh, several strategic programs, uh, which are uh, long range hypersonic weapons, uh, several directed energy programs, which include high energy lasers and high power microwaves. And then we have uh, some mid range capabilities uh, that we execute. And then we have a series of critical outcomes, which are really uh, a lot of innovation, non-traditional small companies uh, bringing, bringing industrial base heartland of America into the defense uh, business where perhaps traditionally they've, they've not had a chance to compete. Uh, and then of course we have our joint uh, counter small UAS mission support we, we give to the joint counter UAS mission executive agency, which is under the command of uh, and control of Major General Sean Ganey. So every, everything that we've been asked to do, of course, uh, is on a rapid pace uh, so that we can uh, and get parity and keep pace with our adversaries in some critical technologies. So uh, some really exciting uh, news uh, since our last opportunity to, to share with this team. Uh, in our long-range hypersonic weapons program, uh, we continue on our testing. Uh, we've begun the fielding of our ground support equipment to our first combat unit. Uh, started earlier this year uh, with that very first company commander and first sergeant who will be, be executing that mission set. And we will deliver over the next uh, about 200 days all of the ground support equipment that uh, unit needs to execute its combat mission. Uh, and that's a extremely uh, fast pace given we, we started this mission uh, on the 14th of February 2019 uh, and executing that the prototype outcome. And then in directed energy, which is, re which is really exciting, uh, we, are, uh, we have several programs, one of which is called uh, the Direct Energy Medium Short Range Air Defense Program. And that is a, a 50 kilowatt uh, laser on a striker vehicle to go with our maneuver combat elements. And so we'll actually go to a combat shoot off here in about 90 days uh, to do the down select of that uh, to our first unit, which we filled in 22. And so uh, we continue on this very quick pace uh, to try to move our material solutions in support of our, our Army strategy of modernization. Uh, you're probably familiar with the, the, you've heard the Army leadership talk about 31 plus four signature programs. Uh, the RCCTO is the plus four. That's where we fit into that uh, under General Murray, the Army Futures Command Commander. And of course, we get our authorities through the Army Acquisition acquisition executive currently that's acting Mr. Bush uh, who gets that directly you know through the secretary side of the headquarters department of the army. So there's a lot going on uh, and we're extremely excited to be part of the team and part of the modernization strategy of the army. So can you talk about John can you talk about the mechanisms and past experiences that you use to enable the RCCTO to, to go fast and do things differently than than the traditional path? Paul, it's, a, it's an interesting question. As I look back, uh, I was just having this conversation with some of my team, my teammates. As I look back at my own career, uh, it, it seems like every job I've had has prepared me for this particular job. Uh, and, and so, there, uh, as I go back and look at how how I did things when I was working in Special Operations Command, and how we executed programs there, and then how I came to the conventional force in in PO aviation, and then PO missiles of space, you know, working on the Army staff. Um, working in the personnel structure uh, and understanding uh, all of those relationships in in the Pentagon and the money systems of the and in the, in the government, how we operate. So I feel really fortunate uh, in, that uh, I've been blessed with some great jobs. And, and all of those jobs have, have taught me some aspect of which we've combined together to make this particular organization successful. And I think there are a couple of hallmarks that do that. I, I think the first is and we have a very short decision cycle and a very short decision chain. Uh, by charter, uh, I'm a direct report to the Secretary of the Army. Uh, and we execute that with what we call the Board of Directors, which are really the Secretary of the Under and the Army Acquisition Executive, the Chief, the Vice, and General Murray, the Army Futures Command Commander. Uh, all great, great Americans and great leaders. Uh, so we are, that Board of Directors is, is the only body that can assign me missions and, and they are my approval authority. 
And so when you have a, a, a short chain of command uh, for decision cycles, then you can make decisions a little bit quicker. Uh, the, the second thing that does is we have very defined mission sets. So we, we define very specifically the, the box, the boundaries of the thing that we're trying to execute. And, and, and I am dogmatic about changes to that. As a matter of fact, I don't allow any changes to that unless the Secretary of the Army and the Board of Directors approve that. Uh, we, we don't have the authority, nor do I seek the authority, to make up my own missions or change those requirements. And if we want to change that very specific focus, then we have to go back to our Board of Directors uh, for that approval. So a short decision chain, a very defined, clear mission set uh, on a very, very fast timeline uh, to execute. And then the third thing that I think is a hallmark of this organization is uh, we've been given the authorities, both in contracting and and money money authorities, uh, to execute the mission that we've been given. And so those kind of three uh, legs of the stool, so to speak, are really what allow us to execute uh, quickly. Obviously, the law is the law, right? You can't change that, and we don't violate that. Uh, and and then we have a set of rules and policies that sometimes help us, and sometimes get don't help us. And so with the board of directors, when we run into that situation, then I, I present that to them and ask for their help to, to overcome some of those things uh, that may, may cause a, a, a boundary problem or a, a vector problem that we might, might need to overcome. And so those three or four things help us uh, execute it at pace. And then the last piece I would say, probably the most important piece is, uh, we've been able to build a very dynamic uh, team of high performers. Uh, and, and what's unique about the team is they're not all engineers. It's a mix of diversity of thought and experience. And if you study high performing teams, one of the things you find is that uh, they have diversity in thought and actions, they have diversity in backgrounds, they each bring a perspective. And then somewhere in all that perspective is, is how we get to the truth and how we get to the right answer. Uh, for our soldiers. So those those stools and those pillars, I think, are what make this organization unique. So how does that team keep track of changes in technology and rapidly evolving technology? Yeah, so that, that that's a great, a great question. One of the things that is a core culture for us that I've tried to, to bring into the organization is we, we must make the assumption that what we're going to do today is going to change. Uh, we, we must embrace the fact that what we know today is not what we know tomorrow. And so uh, traditionally, you may have a program of record and a PEL of any service, and, and they go through a relatively long requirements generation process and get a, a threshold and objective. And then that eventually gets tossed over to the material side, and they put out a performance specification to industry and 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 they bid to a threshold and an objective requirement using cost as an independent variable. And then they execute that program as if those things are set in stone. And, and in fact, they, most of the time they actually are because that's what the test community uses to grade the performance. Uh, it, that process is, is lacking in terms of the ability to adapt and change with technology. And so what we execute to are a set of characteristics. Uh, we, we think we, we, we know going in that we don't know everything, right? <laughs> Which is a little bit of self-awareness. We, we don't know all the answers, but what we know is we want it to behave and have these kind of characteristics. So, for example, for long-range hypersonic weapons, we know we want it to be road mobile. We know we want it to go on a C-17. We know it needs to go long distances at high rates of speed. And, and so we, we work off characteristics, and we use those characteristics to build our prototype. And the reason that's important is because even, even from the time span we're using, which is from 19 to 23, we're going to fill the complete weapon system. That, that's extremely fast in anybody's measurement. From a blank start to building a combat unit, uh, what we call a unit of action. But I, I have one fundamental rule in design, and that is, don't design brick walls to the future. Uh, don't, don't design it so poorly that we can't adapt, knowing fundamentally that the technology is going to change. So look for that. 
Look for ways to build on ramps and look for ways to build off ramps into the design. And, and recognize that, that sometimes programs, not, not intentionally, but we avoid uh, innovation in a program because it changes our threshold re and, and objective requirements, which then causes us to go back to the Jason's process. And then that gets in trouble with the test community on the far right side of that. And so the culture we have to have uh, in this type of organization is, is what we build today must change to the future. It is a change mindset, not a, not a, not a permanency mindset, if that, if that mm -hmm. is helpful. Mm -hmm. And you and I have talked before about how you think about what a prototype is, as, as opposed to something that just meets a set of technical requirements and, you know, maybe ends up sitting on a shelf. It's something that really has to be useful immediately and, and, and put in the hands of someone who's going to use it. Can you talk about that a little more? Yeah, that's a, it's an interesting word, and we throw the word prototyping around quite a bit and for lots of, lots of domains. And, and so in our world, the world of the RCCTO, we define a prototype very narrowly, <laughs> right? Uh, very different than an S&T community would design a prototype, define it. So I'll, let me start with the S&T part of this. We have a great S&T community. They're just brilliant, brilliant engineers, and they do some basic research with 6-1 and 6-2 money, and they start doing applied research if it looks like it's going to work with six three and six four dollars. Um, and, and I would say what they're not doing is actually prototyping. What they're doing is invention, and they're doing demonstrations of technology, normally at the subscale level or a component level. Uh, and they're proving an idea works, and they're just brilliant at it. And they're they're really really great contributors. A prototype in our world is defined as a combat piece of equipment going to a combat unit that a soldier can use and try to see if it has combat utility. It's not making one of a thing, it's making a combat unit of action, which for us is normally a platoon or a battery or a company size element. And, and we give that prototype piece of equipment, a weapon system to a set to a combat unit, that's prototyping. And then we can see if it's gonna have combat utility, if the characteristics that we designed it to actually provide an operational output before we spend a bunch of money trying to determine thresholds and objectives, and before we spend a bunch of money in a, a milestone A and a milestone B and a milestone C uh, to, to see and determine, you know, after some span of time that it works or doesn't work. We, we do that very quickly. And, and you got to go into that knowing that sometimes it's not going to work. <laughs> or, you know, it, it, when you're working at, at, at speed and prototyping, you have to be able to look at yourself in the mirror and go, yeah, this is not really what we, what we want it to become. And, uh, and then uh, sometimes, of course, it's exactly what we want it to become, and then we'll transition that to a program or record. Our organization is not going to build a lot of anything. We are a prototyping organization. We build prototypes for combat units and, and give them a capability they don't currently have at, at the speed of relevance to keep pace with our adversaries and – to apply the latest technology in a short distance. That way, uh, we don't do what you, you hear the chief counsel us on all the time, General McConville, don't fill the brand new thing that's old, right? Build new technology with new things. So, you know, when you talk about sort of fusing that S&T world with, uh, and creating the prototype and, and, and moving to program of record, uh, are there any success stories that you can share with us? Yeah, we, we have a, a for a for a relatively young organization. We've only been organized for about two years, uh, this month actually in April. Uh, we've had a lot of, a lot of success, uh, and and I think Paul, what you just said is important, right? Our our success is standing on the sh shoulders of the S and T community, right? They they've done all the initial work, uh, whether it was from the Army Research Lab, whether it was from the Air Force, whether it was from DARPA, Sandia. I don't care who made the technology. I don't. I, 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 I want to apply the technology for a combat outcome. And so, uh, again, I'll, I'll just use a couple of examples. So we, we fielded uh, what we call the land guardian system. It started uh, in the summer of 19. It's a personal tracking system uh, that we use with our soldiers. Uh, we, we, we did a prototype unit uh, with actually uh, West Point Academy. <laughs> they were our test unit. Uh, we fielded them a, a company's worth of equipment, 
and uh, it did exactly what it was supposed to do, and now we're going to fill that at a much broader scale. Now, I won't do that. I've tra- I'll transition that to a PO to do that, to do that work. Um, the, the hypersonics that I talked about, from 2019 to already fielding our combat equipment to our soldiers is already happening. Uh, in directed energy, uh, we got that mission in April of 2019, uh, sur- right when we stood this organization up. And, and that piece of equipment is completely done. The first prototype vehicle goes to the combat shoot off in about 60 days. And we'll see if it does what we asked it to do. Uh, very, very exciting to get directed energy uh, onto the battle space. And so, and then we have a bunch of other efforts that we, in our critical technology efforts, where we're, we're filled in, uh, actually given to soldiers, uh, computer and electronic security elements uh, that, are, that are prototypes that are out there right now being tested uh, with our units. Uh, and the key is, uh, again, Paul, I think where you, where you, what you said earlier is critical, is we transition everything to a program of record that the Army wants to keep. Um, our, our job is to make prototypes. Our job is to, not to make an army's worth of things. We want to try it to see if it works. Uh, we do that with a, an urgent material release kind of documentation, knowing that there has to be further work done uh, in a program of record should the army want to do that, uh, ra- rather than spend all that investment up front to determine that it really doesn't do what we want it to do, um, which we've seen, unfortunately, we've seen many times in the past. You talk about how OTAs fit into that 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 cycle. It, yeah, our, our other transaction authorities, uh, and I spent a lot of time with Congress when I when I first got this mission, trying to understand their intent with OTAs. What what is it you gave us authority to do, and then how can we use it for the actual intended authority? And so, so if you talk to the congressional uh, members, both the professional staff and actual the the principals themselves. What they'll tell you is that we gave you OTA, other transaction authorities, to actually speed up prototyping. That was the intended purpose of Congress. Don't don't make long programs a record and long requirements generation timelines. Go try it. We're going to give you these authorities to to go through a a streamlined uh, contracting process that's driven by statute, right? Normally through a BAA, through a white paper down select. Uh, we, we do all, everything we do is in, co- in a competitive environment. Uh, so we put out white papers, we do a down select of the white papers, and we choose the one that we, we want to through, uh, through an OTA and a BAA. And, and then we use that prototype in effort to, to get the outcome we desire. Uh, unfortunately, and, and by the way, the OTA allows you to go into a milestone CL rip. It's written in the law that way. So you can actually move from prototyping directly into LRIP, and Congress intended that outcome. Mm-hmm. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes what's happened in the past is uh, we've used OTAs to overcome extended contracting timelines. Uh, that's it, it can certainly do that, but that's a kind of a byproduct of why Congress gave it to us, not the, really the primary intent. The primary intent was to allow us to find a uh, give the department a faster way to actually do prototyping as I defined it and give that unit to, uh, to soldiers as, as fast as we can to see if it works. Kind of following under the business idea of fail, fail fast and fail early, right? Um, and, and then you have to have a, a team and a culture that we've tried to establish here that, that we're going to try this and we're going to put 125% into it and it might not work. And it's okay. It is okay. And, and you got to be able to take risk in doing that, right? You got to mm-hmm. take risk as a leader and you got to protect your teams and you got to be right up front with the leadership of the army. Hey, we, we tried this and, and you know, it, it looks okay, but really not probably not worth the, worth the investment. We, we should probably stop this. Or in the case of, of some of our programs, uh, some I've mentioned already, let's find a way to accelerate even what we're doing. Uh, so the chief all the time is asking me, uh, Neil, how can you go faster? And I'm like, sure, I, I, can't, I can't move one minute faster than I'm going on some of these programs. It's just incredible, uh, the pace. How, so how we're, is that? we're a big fan of OTAs. You, you know, just everything you're talking about, about fail fast, fail early, it, it, it's such a different approach from the traditional. Like, how, how, how has your team adapted? Yeah, so 
So I, I'll give you two perspectives, Paul. It's, a, it's another another super question. So in the government, um, we've been given the ability to hand select our team, and I'm a small teams person, right? Um, we we are organized very flat and very much like a venture capitalist organization. We aggregate, we get a mission, we aggregate a team, we do the mission, we disaggregate the team. I have a very small permanent structure, and that's intentional by design. And so uh, what, what you find is that the S&T teams that we bring in, because they invented the technology, we bring them in we, as we do our prototyping, we wrap around them acquisition professionals who know how to do more than one of a thing and how to, how to build production lines and build industrial bases. And, and some of them love it. They're absolutely thrilled with it. Some of them are uncomfortable with the pace and some of them are uncomfortable with a different approach, right? And so they've, they've been taught and trained DOD 5000 and you got to do it this certain way every time. And I'm like, no, we, we don't have to do that. We're not going to break the law. We're going to inform Congress what we do. I go to Congress every quarter and I lay out every plan and every penny of office and disbursements. No one does that. I mean, I do that every quarter to keep Congress 100% informed of, of what we're doing. Uh, and, and so that is, is pretty unique. And so I, I tell the team when we, we bring people on, I, I, get the, um, I have a, a new introductory meeting with every new member of our team. And I tell them these words. I say, look, you're, you're going to watch us for about 90 days, and we're going to watch you for about 90 days. And we think right now through the interview process with a good mix, but it might not be. <laughs> so in about 90 days, we're going to meet again. And if we still think we're right, then we're off to the races. Um, and so this kind of work is, is clearly not for everybody. And I tell my team, if somebody comes – and they determine that, that it's not the pace they want to work, it's not the risk they want to take, I said, then we'll help them be successful someplace else. Um, we'll, we'll help them be successful wherever they, wherever they want to go and wherever they want to serve. The second part of that is the industry team and the industry part of this. And so uh, one of our, one of our uh, pillars of how we operate is we're totally transparent with the industry. They, they come to my meetings, they see my budget documents. They see my investment strategies. Uh, I see theirs. We use a single IMS between us and our industry partners, a single set of metrics. Uh, and so at, at first, industry was pretty uncomfortable with that. What, what do you mean you're going to come and look at our, our numbers? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that's what we're going to do. And you're going to come and look at mine. And uh, it's particularly in in some of our programs where you have five or six industrial partners that it takes to do this. Uh, and I get them all in the room on the first day at the CEO level. And I go, look, here's the, here's the business set of rules. We're going to have one integrated master schedule across six companies. We're going to share one EVMS across six companies. Uh, we're uncomfortable with that. Then you don't want to be on this team. <laughs> and, and it actually works to their credit. Industry has responded phenomenally. Uh, because they actually see that their their IRAD, which which is hopefully aligned with our S and T investments, is producing output for our soldiers. Yeah. And so that is really uh, paid big dividends. And and one of our outputs uh, that we require when we build our prototype units is a level three technical data package, right? A build to print technical data package. That's pretty unusual to require that at at this level. Industry sometimes has been uncomfortable with that. And I'm just right up front with them, 100% transparent. This is the rule set. You can participate or not. It's totally up to you, but that's not negotiable. Um, and and I'll just say, even at the at the defense, you know, the big defense companies, uh, and even the small companies have responded phenomenally. Uh, it, it's just been a really interesting experience to watch the team come together. I'll give you an example. Most of our contracts have contract uh, deliverables. We call them seed rules. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I tell my team in, in my meeting, which is all my team, my, my industry partners, my government partners, my test team, all those, they're all together. And I say, look, you, you have, when you receive a document from industry, you have 24 hours to approve it. And, and the first, my team's like, no, 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 we need to review it. And I, no, 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 no. You should have helped write the document. <laughs> We're not grading papers here. We don't have time to grade papers. We're here to do this together as a team. 
And, and so when that document gets to the government, you should have helped write that document. It should not be the first time you've seen it. You should go, yep, that's what we talked about. It's in there, done. So I give my team 24 hours to approve through the deliverables um, because we need that relationship. We need that culture to be different, right? We're, we're not there to grade papers. We're there to do this together as an industry government team. I have to imagine that that took some getting used to with the industry partners. I mean, uh, ha has there been a big change, you know, over the time you've been you've been doing this in terms of how they've responded and how you've worked with them? Well, I, I, you know, I would say first that uh, there was a lot of what we would call push to test, right? <laughs> they would go, okay, this is what you said. Here's our thing. Did you really do that? Did you do what you say you're going to do? And uh, and we do that. We, we keep we keep our commitments on both sides of the equation. And, uh, and so I would tell you that that trust is invaluable. It's also fungible. You, you have to be transparent and you have to be honest all the time. And quite frankly, I'll, I'll, be just, I'll just speak for myself. I, I'm not smart enough to keep up with the lies that even I wanted to. So, so I don't try to. I just try to be honest all the time. Uh, and I found that that relationship uh, is very positive. Uh, it's very refreshing. But, but to your point, Paul, it's, it, you know, truth and lending, that first few months is kind of a little push to test. We're testing them, they're testing us. And then we realize that we're pretty serious about this and, and we're going to do this differently. Uh, it's, it really has bond, built a strong bond and a strong relationship. You think, I mean, given the, the, the cutting edge sort of uh, S&T nature of what you're doing, you know, so much of you know, evolving technology is being done in, in very disruptive parts of the economy. Are there, are there places here for non-traditional defense, you know, uh, companies that haven't traditionally been defense companies, but are technology disruptors to play a part in what you're doing? Yeah, we, we do. Um, as a matter of fact, we, we do a couple of things that I think are a little bit unique. Um, so one of the missions the secretary gave us was specifically that, Paul, which was look for disruptive technologies. And, and most of those, quite frankly, are not in the big primes, right? They, they do that. They do that somewhat, but a lot of that is in mid, middle tier or really small companies. And so we we established a program which we call Innovation Days, uh, and we we do this once a year, and uh, we send an RFI out uh, through OTA and BAA, and we say we're looking for some technologies in this particular area. Anybody that's got something coming send us a white paper, we'll look at it. Uh, the first year we did that was in 2019. Uh, we did it in the Washington DC area because some technologies are geographically um, you know, located. Sure. And, and uh, we got 170, a little over 170 responses. And what we do then is we do a, a, a paper down select and we, we bring about 30 companies uh, to give oral presentations. It's a shark tank essentially. Uh, like you would see on 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 TV, so we have a panel of experts again from from the the Army Futures Command, from the test community, from the centers of excellence, from the PO community, the S and T community, a, a a panel of experts, and each company gets the 30 minutes to come in and give a presentation. We ask them questions, and then we tell them right there on the spot: Yes, we're interested. No, we're not. Um, and then we go into what's called the concept refinement stage. So the first one, we selected 12 companies. Uh, they're all in con under contract executing uh, those. And I'll, I'll give you one example of one of the companies the first time. This company had developed this technology. I won't, I won't give you any names, but this company had developed this technology to lay, lay fiber cable uh, at the same pace you can paint a road. So they basically took a, one of those road painter machines and, and put something like a Linex in it and, and laid it over top of fiber cable at that speed. Well, that would be really helpful in, you know, national disaster area. That'd be really helpful if we were standing up, you know, Ford operating bases right. uh, to do that very quickly. And so I said to the, there were four people there from the team and I said, hey, this is really, really interesting technology. I said, I'd like to come and see your company. And uh, he goes, it, it's us, we're all here. It's all four of us. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and so that's pretty unique. We did our second one in, in 2020. Uh, we did it in Texas with the Army Futures Command. We teamed with the Army Futures Command uh, in, the, uh, in the applications laboratory there. We had 800, over 800 respondents. 
we downslide that to about 30, and uh, we're moving uh, about six of those to contract right now. Our next one is, uh, is going to come up here this year. We're going to try to do it in June, and RFI will come out pretty quick to industry uh, for very specific things. And, and the idea, I think, Paul, to your point is we've got to go to find where the technology is. We've got to give companies an opportunity to get to us that don't know how to do this. Look, most yeah. of these small companies, <laughs> you know, they don't, they don't really know much about the FAR. They don't know much about contracting mechanisms. What they know is they got a great idea, and they want to talk to somebody about it. And so we're trying to give them uh, that mechanism. And then the last example I give you in counter small UAS, same thing. There are a lot of small companies out there that have really interesting technologies that can help us in counter UAS systems. So twice a year in that domain, we have what we call semi-annual demonstration days. We just had one at, at YPG, uh, Yuma Proving Grounds, and literally we, same kind of process. We send out a white paper request, RFI, we down select, and, and they actually bring their kit to the range, and we have a fly off. We say, all right, here's your target, go kill it. And, uh, and these uh, companies just, <laughs> they're just dying to give us this information. And, and this disruptive technology, we finally created a mechanism uh, to do that. And, and, and here's the unique thing about this. When we started this with Congress, we, we had to go find money in the year of execution, which is a wicked hard problem in our defense budgeting process. But we did, our team did it. We found that wherever we could find it. Finally, in, 20, in 21, Congress, who I've been briefing every quarter on this every year, appropriated dollars just for this purpose. And so, and I told Congress, I'll, I'll come over and report every penny I spend to you on every company we do it with uh, to give you the, the oversight that you need as our congressional uh, legislation body. Mm -hmm. And so we're really excited that this year we actually have money appropriated by Congress for innovation, uh, which is really really speaks to the team's effort over the last two years to, yeah. to give this credibility to, to Congress. And Congress has just been really supportive of the idea. That's great. It's hard to imagine those small shark tank type companies that you're describing being able to go through the normal process and having to have all of that capability to uh, you know follow FAR and do all the reporting and follow the, the, the requirements they would have to follow in the traditional sort of procurement cycle. Yeah, I, I think most of them, it's, it's you know, most of them have no idea how to give a formal, even a formal presentation. <laughs> I mean, they're just great people with this great idea. And they just need a voice no. uh, to hear it. And, uh, you know, because we do prototyping, which is mostly with RDT and E dollars, you know, it's really a different set of rules than a program or record, you know, using six, 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 seven, six, eight dollars. You know, we're very early on in the process. So we can apply that rule set from the Army acquisition executive, uh, Mr. Bush, who really gives us a lot of support. Yeah. So, General, I know we have a couple of minutes left. This, it's been great to chat with you about this today. It's such a fascinating topic and so different uh, and so unique in terms of uh, the traditional environment. I, I guess uh, uh, sort of a last question I would have is, you know, how do you see this evolving into the future? Do you think that the lessons that you're learning in the RCCTO and the, the, the different kind of uh, approaches you're taking will Will it expand into other similar uh, efforts like yours? Will it uh, just give your organization the chance to grow its domain? Or do you think this will have an impact, you know, in, in larger cross sections of, uh, of how the Army procures? So I, I think, Paul, there's a, there's a couple of ways to look at this. You know, the, the technologies that our organization is, is working on are, are you know, very defined part of the Army modernization strategy, 31 plus four, right? They're very yeah. specific outcomes yeah. for very specific reasons on a very specific timeline. Um, the, the Army has traditional programs that are out there that still have to do modernization, right? You still have to keep up the helicopters. You still got to keep up the tanks. You got to keep up the trucks, keep up the radios. And so these tools that Congress has given us can be a, applied much broader than just in the RCCTO, right? The OTA mm -hmm. construct. Mm -hmm. um, but you have to be able to uh, accept some risk in that, right? And, and sometimes we have a problem accepting risk. And so 
I'm pretty sure they gave him this job because I'm totally expendable, right? It, 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 <laughs> hey, if it doesn't work, just blame Thurgood. Um, and, and I'm good with that, right? I'm good with trying trying new things. Everything in my career has really, I felt in my heart, prepared me for this job. And and I, I feel pretty honored to be fortunate to lead this great organization and this great team. And, and then this team is not just my organization, right? It's the war fighting organizations. It's the S&T organizations. It's the contracting teams. It's the legal folks. You know, we try to bring all that together and synchronize that uh, when we give equipment to soldiers. It's just not about the widget. It's, it's about the doctrine and the leadership and the people and the training and talent management. All of those things make this successful. Um, so there is a, there's a need for this type of organization, and there's a need for this to broaden at some scale at, yeah. at a larger across the PO structure. And I think we'll learn that and mature that thought process as, as we go forward, if that's helpful. Great. Well, General, thank you. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to, to chat today. And it's a, it's, it's a fantastic topic. Um, and uh, so I think uh, we're coming to the end of our time. Um, I think uh, I will uh, turn it back over to David and Scott uh, back in the, oh, I guess it's not David and Scott anymore. Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, Paul, we'll explain who it is. But let me, first of all, say to you, thank you. Outstanding job, Paul. And Lieutenant General, uh, really, uh, <laughs> above and beyond, you missed your calling. This is, well, the, the, both of you are just great. You got to take this on the road, maybe a TV show someday, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll thank tell you, you so it's, it's a great it's a great honor to lead the team. They're doing phenomenal work. Paul, thanks for your time today and, and uh, for the discussion. Love the discussion. Uh, yeah, and thanks absolutely. to the American Futures. No, thanks to both of you. Be safe, be strong, and we'll see you down the road, I'm sure. Thanks to you both. All Thank right. You Thank you. Take care.